Good morning. morning. Please stand and join me in the call to worship, which is printed in your bulletin. We come into worship waiting for the word of the Lord to enlighten us. That's not the one you have? Maybe I should follow my bulletin then. Let's try this again. Sing praises and give thanks to God for his faithfulness. Let us give thanks to God and praise his holy name. Let us call to mind the deeds of the Lord, remembering his mercy and grace. God's grace are good and wisdom. Let us give praise to God who has set a clear path for us. Let us worship God, creator and governor of all things good. Please be seated. Please stand. please be seated. I'm just going to check. (laughs) I think we're good. Sometimes we look around us and see things other people have and wonder why we can't enjoy those things. Sometimes we question whether God is being fair when it seems as though we struggle. Sometimes we forget that the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills has every right to to bless as he chooses. Sometimes we forget that God calls us to be faithful in the small things before he gives us more. Every one of these thoughts calls us to seek forgiveness from a God who is wise beyond all measure, even beyond our claim to be wise. We come to this time of confession asking God to reshape our thinking, to be patient with us, and to forgive our trying to second-guess his kindness. Pray this prayer of confession with me. Father, forgive our questions and our desires that are not part of your plan for us. Forgive us when we try to supersede your wisdom, your understanding of who you are and what we can handle. Forgive us when your eyes are bigger than our hearts. Forgive us when we forget that all good things come from you. 
Forgive us when we accept limitations of what you want us to be and to be. Let's just take a moment in silent prayer. Now hear these words of assurance. Our God is a loving, kind God. He wants to provide for our needs. He wants to bless us with his favor. It is ours to remember that his judgments and his testimony are worth more than gold. God hears our confessions and stands ready to forgive and put away all our transgressions. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you. Please take a moment to stand and greet everyone in the name of the Lord. I'd like to invite the children down for the children's message. I don't want to call any kids out. There we go. Yes, we got a child. Wonderful. <laughs> Good morning. How are you doing? Good? Did Ellie, does Ellie want to come down? Okay, that's all right. All right, so we've been going over the Ten Commandments. I'm just going to include all of you in the children's message this morning. Um, and I have hand gestures for the Ten Commandments. Would you hold this for me? So um, the first commandment is love God more than anything else. So you put up one finger. It's the way to remember. This is a mnemonic device to remember the Ten Commandments. There's only one God. That's the first commandment. Have no other gods before God. Second commandment, hold up your second finger, right, like this, parallel to your first finger. Nothing can be equal to God. So that is, do not commit idolatry. Do not worship things above God. Third commandment, put your three fingers over your mouth like this. Do not speak any bad words about God. Do not misuse the name or disrespect the name of God. The fourth, this becomes like a pillow. So remember the Sabbath, keep it holy, and make sure that you rest on the seventh day. Very important. Uh, fifth, you make a salute sign, and you salute your parents. Honor your mother and father. Six, this becomes like a, uh, becomes like a knife. I know that's a little violent, but um, do not murder. And in this case, never hurt anyone. Never hurt anyone else. OK, number seven, this is a couple. So uh, do not commit adultery. Do not do something that's going to divide a husband and wife. Number eight. Put your three fingers together like this and grab them. Do not steal. Do not take anything that doesn't belong to you. Number nine, this is uh, like in balance scales, so do not lie. And number 10, make a grabbing motion. Do not covet what belongs to someone else. So there you go. That's a way to remember the Ten Commandments. Let's say a prayer. Dear God, we, we thank you for guiding us and giving us your law. Your law is a blessing. We read in scripture that your word is a light unto our path, and we know that your law is a guidance for us, so we give thanks, God, for your commandments. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, thank you for coming up, and you, if you want to, you can go to your Sunday school room. Does she go to Sunday school? Or you can, yeah, or you can sit with your parents. Thank you for coming up.
please be seated. We have a few announcements this morning. First, I don't know if you noticed, but when you drove into the church, the entrance on Beekman Road, did you notice the uh, landscaping around the sign on the corner of Beekman and Clove Branch? It looks beautiful. So I want to thank all the volunteers who helped us to beautify that area on Friday. I would like to thank uh, Dave Katz, who's a landscape architect with the Neves Group. Dave donated his time to uh, help us create that, um, that beautification plan. And uh, he also uh, selected the, the shrubbery. And so thank you to Dave and the Neves Group. Um, I also want to thank all the volunteers who served on Friday. We had 15 volunteers. Ann Bell, Jan Bushy, Gary Cassero, Don and Charlotte Garrison, Dale Moses Taylor, Dave O'Malley, Mary Ella Post, Bill and Judy Prohl, Dave Scholes, Rick Sodler, Nancy Williford, and Jay Wright. And uh, we had a great time uh, serving. And I also want to thank Carol O'Malley, who brought the cupcakes for Jan. We celebrated Jan's birthday, so happy birthday. Uh, we had a great time. So thank you to everyone. I also want to welcome some dear friends who are here this morning. I welcome Reverend Eric and Nancy Tice. Would you stand up? Welcome. So Eric used to be the pastor of St. John's Reformed Church. And you may remember a couple of years ago, we were praying for Eric um, every Sunday for a long period of time, for many months when he was very sick. And it's just wonderful to see you uh, here. Eric also preached at my um, installation service when I first became a pastor here. So uh, it's just great to have you here. Um, they were missionaries serving in Croatia years ago. And uh, many years ago, I went to attend. Um, I, I visited them in, in Prague when Eric received his PhD in, in uh, Reformed Theology. And it's just, uh, we've been good friends throughout the years, and it's just great to have you here. So welcome. Uh, Vacation Bible School is going very well. We have uh, 60 students signed up for August 14th to 18th. We're in need of some snack donations, so donations of snacks. If you can talk to uh, Linda Smith, she will tell you exactly what they need. Or you can send in a check with VBS in the, men in the memo uh, to help fund the snacks for VBS. We also need more volunteers to serve in the 24 Hours of Praise event. I'm really excited about this event. It's going to be on August 18th, starting at 7 p.m. We're going to worship God continuously through to Saturday at 7 p.m. We have uh, several area churches that are joining us in this effort, about 15 uh, music groups and praise bands and choirs that are be going to be coming from all these different churches. Uh, so it's going to be a great event. Um, we have a team of about uh, 30 or so volunteers, but we, we need a few more people. So here's what we need. We, um, we need some people to pray, to be prayers. Uh, what we have is people that have signed up to be kind of praying for the event, and that's great. But we also need people to pray in teams <clears throat> for people who are attending the event. So when people are attending the event and they come forward in need of prayer, we want to have people ready to go to bring them to the side to pray with them. So if you're feeling called to do that, um, I want us to kind of work on this as a whole church. We also have volunteers coming from other churches providing some of this, but we want to be ministering to people as they're here. Uh, so that's one thing. And we have a sign-up sheet in the fellowship hall for that. Uh, the second is we need some more people to help to direct traffic and to park. We're going to do parking in the uh, Kronizer lot. Um, and so we need about seven more people to sign up to help us direct park it, parking. You get to use one of those cool orange flashlights, if you, uh, if you, and you get a vest, so that's the incentive. Um, we also need a few people to help with security. We will have the police here, but if anybody is, has uh, some training in security, we could use some extra help with that. And um, if anybody has served as an EMT, we're going to have an ambulance here just to be on hand if anyone needs it. Um, anyway, there's all sorts of opportunities to serve this event, so check the card table in the fellowship hall to, uh, to decide what you'd like, how you'd like to serve. Um, I was looking at the Facebook ad, and um, we've had 450 people click through to our website from the Facebook ad, and so we estimate that there'll be about 450 people here for the event. Um, just as an indication, when we were advertising for the Living Nativity last December, we had about 1,500 people click through to our website from that Living Nativity ad, and we had about 2,000 people attend. So um, 
So we may have a little bit more than 450. So I think there's going to be a lot of people here, and uh, it'll be a great event. Um, let's see. We also have, on the Sunday after August, August 20th, so that Sunday after um, the uh, revival event, uh, we're going to do a remembrance of our baptism by full immersion in the Fishkill Creek. So here's how that's going to work. We'll have our worship service here, 8.30 to 9.30. And at 9.30, anyone who wants to recommit and remember their baptismal vow, um, at 9.30, we're all going to walk down to the creek. We're going to do baptisms in the creek. And then at uh, 10.30, we'll start the service up here. And somebody asked me in the first service, how are you going to dry out between, between the first service between that service and this service. I'll figure that out later, but um, I, I'll be dry, don't worry. Um, so if you're feeling moved to want to recommit your life to Christ and to remember your baptismal vow, this is not a rebaptism. this is a, a remembrance of your baptism, then you can sign up also for that in the fellowship hall. Um, also, if you do uh, decide to come um, and, and to remember your baptism, make sure to bring a bathing, seat, a bathing suit, a towel, a change of clothes, and some canoe sneakers, because it's probably not good to be barefooted in the creek. Um, I'd like to invite Kevin Phillips forward. He's, gonna, he's our missionary of the month this month, and he's going to tell us about his organization called the Intentional Leadership Development USA. Well, good morning. good morning. It's a great day to be at Hopewell, eh? Yes. I mean... In 1992, Hopewell invited me to be the Director of Christian Education and Youth Ministry here. And I got to tell you, it was a real easy yes. Because at the core of Hopewell, there's a DNA piece that this place has just got generosity. Hmm? Generosity is attractive. And I remember in the early 90s sitting in missions, and actually it's kind of painful because the needs always outweighed our resources. Hmm? So it was always... And yet, through the 90s, and uh, really manifesting itself in the 2000s, that generosity actually took a little change. Because just sending a check is not the kind of giving that we see in Jesus. And so we moved from being a generous church, a giving church, we actually moved to being a sending church. And we, uh, we had young people in, in, in other countries, we, uh, we were sending our teenagers out on, on mission trips. And, uh, and we had some really outstanding homegrown people that we sent. So our generosity went past just sending a check. We were actually sending people. Um, in a birth, uh, some organization called Sowers. And, I, and actually there's a Sowers trip going on right now that we, I think we'll pray for. Um, and it, it birthed an organization called JLife USA which now is called ILD USA, um, Intentional Leadership Development. To give you a picture of what that looks like, there's a young man in our church, married, just had his second child. His name's Louis Orocho. He grew up in our youth ministry here. He went on mission trips. God sowed that seed. And I has he spoken in second service? Probably not. Huh? Yeah, I think he has. Yeah. Told him so, I mean, he's... You know, he's, he's a built guy. He, um, he's leading that Midnight Run program right now because we, as a congregation, supported his opportunities as, as a teenager to connect with God in a way that it becomes more and more a lifestyle. Serving in these four walls is important, but serving outside these four walls is how we generate closeness with God in, in a lifestyle of service that we see in Jesus. Another organization that was that was birthed out of here is ILD USA, and um, and so we're able to provide because of Hopewell opportunities throughout the world to help churches, help missionaries, pastors, youth leaders to understand what it means to not just be a giving church, but to understand the disciple-making process of Jesus to grow up leaders in their, in, in their ministries that understand that following Jesus is not just a, a one-hour-a-week thing on, on Sunday, that it's a lifestyle. And, uh, and when, you, when you put that generosity motivated by Jesus' love, it's a magnet. Hmm? I mean, it's why we're sitting here today. 
because Hopewell has that DNA, and that DNA is growing uh, significantly from what I see with our new pastor. So if you want to know more, uh, Sarah said I should hold this up, and there's a pile of these out on the kiosk, and feel free to, to get that to see uh, what we're doing. We're very excited at this moment because we've uh, just acquired a training center in central New York, and uh, our, our ministry's uh, moving, uh, moving out to uh, providing academic internships that are giving college credits. And uh, even in this last year, we've been serving in some new countries. So uh, most, most years we actually provide training in all, on all six continents. So thank you, Hopewell, for, being, for birthing this ministry. Thank you for your constant support of it. And uh, I've never been Missionary of the Month, so uh, I'll have to put that on my resume now. Huh? <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Scripture says that those who are faithful with what God has provided will receive the blessing of enjoying his riches even more. Those who understand that it is a privilege to have a place to worship and hear the word of the Lord are those who support that privilege by giving. Our offering will now be received. Thank you for bringing us to your house today. Thank you for blessing, for the blessing of hearing your word. Thank you for the blessing of fellowship with others. Please use these gifts to enhance what you have begun in this place. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Now let us join our hearts together to offer our prayers to God. Let us pray. God, there's so many people in our church family, in our community, among our families and among our friends who are in need of intercessory prayers. People who are grieving, people who are struggling with illness, so we Lift these names up to you now, Lord. Continue to pray for Laura Rose, for Ginny Young, for Teresa Gerlach, for Jeff Miller, for Carrie Roger. We pray for this search for a new Odyssey pastor, pastor of our Odyssey congregation. God, we pray that you'd be preparing that person's heart and drawing them to us. And we pray for 
our friends in the Odyssey community, especially for our friends from the Greenbrier Center in Millbrook, they had a, they've been having a difficult week, so we pray, God, for their peace, for you to be with them. We lift up to you in prayer Vaughn Saprenant, Phyllis Ford, John Marchesona, Kim Skorlick and her family at the passing of her grandfather, for Beth Lazaro's nephew Dan recovering from a stroke, for Bob Lazaro. God, we continue to pray for this little baby, four month old Reese James, as he recovers from surgery to remove a cancerous tumor. Pray that you would rid his body of cancer, God. Heal him. We pray for Scott Snow and his mother. Continued prayers for Jean and Tom Salag and their granddaughter, Kylie. God, we continue to pray for Samantha Conrad after her accident. and We pray for her new job. And Lord, we lift up to you now the names of others in our families and among our friends and in our community who are in need of prayer. Just call out the name as you feel moved. Lord, please, please hear our prayers. May these people feel healing taking place in their bodies and their minds and their souls. God, give them a sense of peace, the peace that passes all understanding. May they lean on you, release themselves into your care, and sense your closeness, closeness of your Holy Spirit. God, we pray for this worship event coming up on August 18th and 19th. We pray that you'd bless this event, that you'd bless all the people coming to this event. That this would be a time of ministering to people, helping them in their difficulties, and helping them to grow closer to you. And we pray for the sowers of the kingdom in this trip to the Dominican Republic. We pray for... Ron and Dave and all of the members who are going down to serve in the DR this week. We pray that you'd keep them safe. We pray that you would use them to be a blessing to people in the DR. And we give thanks because we know that when we serve in mission, we are even more blessed by the people that we're serving with than we're able to be a blessing. So we give thanks for the ways that they will be surprised and blessed We pray for Kevin Phillips and the intentional leadership development work that he's doing and helping leaders and congregations in their discipleship. <coughs> and Lord, now we pray the prayer that you have taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And Lord, now we also ask you in prayer that you would open our hearts as we approach your holy word. Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. Teach us by your word today. Fill us with a desire to serve you more fervently and to obey you more faithfully. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning we're continuing our summer sermon series on the Ten Commandments. And you know, we sometimes think about the Ten Commandments, the laws of God, the 
the ordinances of God as being oppressive or being, you know, something that's hard to live up to. But I want to share what Scripture says about the law of God. This is from Psalm 19, verses 7 to 14. Listen for God's word. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the law of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The reverence of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. And here this reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 17, we come to the 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor their male servant, nor female servant, nor their ox or donkey, nor anything that belongs to your neighbor. Here is the reading of God's word for us this morning. May God help us as we seek to understand these words. So this morning we come to this 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet. And this is one of those commandments that I think gets overlooked. I think because we don't necessarily easily understand what this means to covet. To covet means to want, to intensely desire something that someone else has. In the 30 or so years that I've been in ministry, I've heard people confess lots of these commandments over time. The sin of lying or stealing or adultery. But I can honestly say I've never had anyone come into my office and say, Pastor, uh, I have to, I have this heavy weight on me. I've been coveting my neighbor's car. But this is an important commandment because the root of it is to desire what we do not have. And that leads to a deep con discontent in our souls. It says in Hebrews 13, 5 to 6, keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. So to be free from coveting is the pathway to contentment. To covet is not exactly the same thing as to desire. I mean, it's, it's okay to want something, to want a new house or to want a new car. Or a few years ago for me, it was to want to get married, to want a wife. Coveting, though, is to want your neighbor's house or your neighbor's car or your neighbor's wife. That's what's off limits. Well, I have to admit that I have broken this commandment of coveting to desire what someone else has. You remember last summer when uh, it was so dry out, we had this drought, and everybody's lawn was turning brown, um, including my lawn. Almost everybody's lawn turned brown. The exception to that was my neighbor's lawn. My neighbor's lawn was this beautiful deep green, and I thought, how are they doing that? I don't see them watering the lawn, how is it? I want that lawn. I want that. And then I started thinking, what am I becoming? Am, am I becoming that suburban guy who finds his meaning in having this beautiful, lush, perfect carpet-like lawn, which, by the way, is exactly what I want? <laughs> and then Sarah said to me, well, I'll, I'll know you're, you've gone too far if I catch you waxing the lawnmower. So, um, I, so far, I have not waxed the lawnmower. I, I haven't gone that far. <laughs> But I do have to admit, I wanted my, my friend's lawn. Here's another one I have to admit. Um, I have never owned a car in the decade that I'm living in. And this, this has partly been by choice. I've always chosen um, inexpensive, compact cars, because it's, 
It's just, it's just uh, more efficient. But in my heart, more than anything, I want a Chevy Silverado. <laughs> I want a nice big black truck. And I have to admit, I have, I have coveted some of my friends' trucks. I really want a truck. It's just not practical, especially now with the family. It's not practical. I did talk to Sarah. We talked about buying a truck a couple years ago. She's like, we can only have two cars. We can't, how are you going to fit a baby in the truck? I'm like, you're right, you're right, yes. The other thing about coveting is we don't often see a person's whole situation, and we wouldn't necessarily really want uh, the whole situation if we knew what was behind it. For example, I found out, uh, well, I wouldn't want my friend's uh, truck payments, for example. Um, I also found out why my neighbor's lawn was so green. It's because their lawn is actually a swamp. And uh, this summer, when it's been so wet, uh, they're getting their mower stuck in the swamp. I went over to help them winch out the mower. Romans chapter 13, verse 9 says, The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment is summed up in this phrase, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. So one of the problems with coveting, like all breaking all of those commandments, is that it's not the way to love your neighbor. If we're wanting what our neighbor has, it's, it's uh, nursing a sense of jealousy, and that's not the way to be loving toward our neighbor. That's one problem with it. Coveting also distances us from God. It robs us of contentment. Here's what Jesus said about coveting. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus was teaching a crowd of people, and one of the people in the crowd said, Jesus, can you please tell my brother to give me my share of the inheritance? And Jesus said to him, watch out. He said, be on your guard against all kinds of covetousness, because life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And then he told them this parable. He said there was a man who had many fields, and the fields produced this abundant harvest. It was more grain than the man could possibly store in his barns. So the man said, I know what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns, and I'll build bigger barns. I'll put all the grain in those barns, and then I can sit back and relax. I can eat, drink, and be merry. And God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is demanded of you. Who then will get what you've stored up for yourself? Jesus said, this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Jesus said, life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. So here's the other problem. To covet robs us of life. John D. Rockefeller is still considered to be the, the wealthiest American who ever lived. And he was asked one time, Mr. Rockefeller, how much money is enough? And he answered wittily, he said, just a little bit more. Colossians 3, 5 says, put to death within you those evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. So to covet, to desire things too intensely, that's a form of idolatry. It's a form of putting things before God. In Matthew chapter 6, 19 to 21, Jesus said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Instead, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. To covet is a sickness of the heart. So to summarize that, coveting leads to deep discontentment. It's not a way to be loving toward our neighbor. It distances us from God. It robs us of life. It's a form of idolatry, and it's a sickness of the heart. The opposite of coveting, of intense desire, is contentment. So one question is, how do we keep ourselves from coveting? But I think a better question a deeper question is, how do we find contentment? The Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, I have learned the secret of being content in all circumstances. I've learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether well-fed or whether hungry, whether living in plenty or living in want. I've learned the secret of contentment. So what is that secret of contentment? 
I want to share with you a, a story this morning about a couple that I met in 2016. They were Reformed Church missionaries. Their names were Dick and Donna Swart, and they lived in southern Ethiopia along the Omo River, serving the Dasanich people, a tribal group in southern Ethiopia. Donna was serving as a gynecologist who'd helped to deliver hundreds of children in the tribe over many decades. And Dick was serving as an engineer who had designed and built simple, reproducible windmill systems that pumped water from the Omo River to irrigate the fields of the Dasanich people. And we in the Reformed Church estimated that between their work over the years, between Donna's delivery of children and Dick's um, creating these windmill systems, these irrigation systems, that together their work saved the lives of about 5,000 children over the years. Children who otherwise would have either died in childbirth or would have died of starvation. They did incredible work in Africa. And I stayed with them in their tiny house while I was there. And their house was so simple. Their house was built out of plywood and corrugated tin. They had three small rooms in their house. They had a kitchen, they had a living room, and they had a bedroom. And each of those rooms was only about 12 feet by 12 feet. The total square footage of their house was less than 450 square feet. I still remember the, the plywood floors were just simple plywood that were painted gray with carpets on top. Their possessions were so simple, plastic plates and a couch that was probably 40 years old. And they didn't have a TV, they had some books. And there was such peace in their home. And we'd gather around their small little kitchen table each night as we ate. And first Dick and Donna would read from the scriptures. And then we would sing a hymn together. And then we would hold hands and we would pray. And I just felt that I was living, staying with these two people who had found contentment. And I remember I, saying to them just being just impressed with how simply they were living and saying, you know, do, it's, this is so different than the way we live in the United States. Have you ever, do you ever want a bigger house? And they answered, no. We have all we need here. I remember Dick saying, God has always supplied us with everything we need. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 to 11, it says, there are some people who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world. We can take nothing out. But if we had food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich, Paul said, fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. He said some people are eager for money. They've wandered far away from the faith. They've pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, people of God, he said, you should flee from this. You should pursue righteousness and godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. So how do we find that kind of contentment? The kind of contentment that Paul's preaching about, the kind of contentment that Dick and Donna Swart had found. The answer may sound simple, but the answer is in Christ. It's in Christ that we find perfect peace. Contentment with exactly who we are, exactly where we are, exactly where we are in our careers, exactly where we are in our station in life. Contentment with exactly what little we have. Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. When the Lord is our shepherd, we shall want for nothing. When we have Christ, we truly have all we need. We have love, we have acceptance, we have righteousness, not by our own effort, but through the gift of God that's given to us. We have no fear of anything, we have no anxiety, we have a perfect peace which passes all understanding in Christ. That's contentment. If the Lord is our shepherd, now I'm not just saying 
Like we've recited that psalm so many times. When the Lord is truly your shepherd, when you've truly made that decision to make the Lord your shepherd, your guide, the one who leads you, the one who you follow, the one who protects you and guides you, Jesus won't be, he doesn't push himself into your life, he doesn't demand to be your Lord. You have to make him, you have to decide, yes, I want you to be my Lord. Even that desire to want Jesus to be our Lord is awakened within us from a gift from the Holy Spirit. But if we make him our Lord, if he's our Lord, we'll want for nothing. But I do have to admit that Jesus is my Lord and I still want a truck, so I don't know where that leaves me. (laughs) But that's contentment, a perfect peace. Let us pray. Lord, free us from covetousness. Free us from too intense a focus on money and things. Help us to be fully content with exactly who we are, what we have, where we are. Lord, we want you to be our shepherd. We shall not want You maketh us to lie down in green pastures. You leadeth us beside still waters. You restoreth our soul. Yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil, for thou art with us. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort us. Thou anointest our head with oil, our cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. You're all welcome to come to this table. This is Jesus' table. This table does not belong to me. It doesn't belong to the Hopewell Reformed Church. It doesn't belong to the Reformed Church in America or to the classes of Mid-Hudson. This table is literally Jesus' table. And as his table, he welcomes us here. All who've been baptized, all who desire a closer walk with Jesus. Please join me in the prayer which is printed in your bulletin. Lord, let us lift up our hearts. We lift our hearts to you. You have created the heavens and the earth. You've given us life and you preserve us with your blessings. You've shown us the fullness of your love in sending into the world your eternal word, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who became human for us and for our salvation. For this precious gift, we praise and bless your holy name. And with the whole church on earth and with the company in heaven, we worship and adore your glorious name, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, send your Holy Spirit upon us. We pray that the bread which we break may be to us the communion of the body of Christ and the cup which we bless may be the communion in his blood. And as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. 
on the same night that Jesus was betrayed. He took the bread and he broke it and showed it to his disciples and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take this as often as you do so in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup and giving thanks, he showed it to his disciples and said, this is the cup of the new covenant. This is my blood, which has been shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Take this as often as you do so in remembrance of me. The bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ.
The cup of blessing which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. Please join me in the prayer of thanksgiving, which is printed in your bulletin. Since the Lord has now fed us at his table, let us praise his holy name with thanksgiving, and everyone say with mouth and heart, bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all his Who forgives all your iniquity. Who redeems your life from the pit? The Lord is merciful and gracious. He does not deal with us according to our sins. For as the heavens are high above the earth, as far as the east is from the west. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who stand in the Lord. Who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, and will also give us all things with him. Therefore shall my mouth and heart show forth the praise of the Lord, and his time forth forevermore. Amen. Amen. The hymn is Be Thou My Vision, hymn 532. And as you leave this place today, may God's love sustain you, and may you love those who surround you. May God's spirit empower you, and may you empower all those you meet. And may God's joy fill your heart, and may this joy overflow. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forever. Amen.